I have absolutely no disclosure still as of this date. Um, and I won't be showing you a close-up picture of Hamilton, that's for sure. It's definitely not as nice as Vancouver. Um, what I will discuss is endovascular techniques for acute ischemic stroke due to large vessel occlusions. I'll focus mostly on the anterior circulation and a little bit on the posterior circulation. And then from doing hundreds of cases over the last year and a half, um, I'll show you factors that I think really influence the outcomes in these patients and what we did in Hamilton to develop a protocol that really improved our times. Um, so as I'm called to the angio suite and I'm on my way to do a stroke case, I'm always thinking about, is this patient gonna need intubation because they're so unstable? Posterior circulation, a lot of our patients are intubated and Waleed showed a date on that. Then I sort of wonder what type of sheath am I gonna be using based on the CT angiogram and the ARCH data. Um, no guide catheter, regular guide catheter, balloon guide catheter, a distal or intermediate catheter, aspiration catheter, or a stent retriever as sort of my go-to approach. Um, and then whether I'll need pharmacological adjunctive therapy such as IA, TPA. So I, we usually have that prepared um, and at least ready in the room in case we need it to help try to deal with some of the more difficult clots. Um, so you can see from the picture there, we've had experience with penumbra, we've had experience with wedging um, aspiration catheters and using stent retrievers as rescue therapy, as well as just standard stent retriever therapy. And I think another really important point is when you have a difficult case is knowing when to stop. Um, so I was hoping the audience response system would work, and I sort of just, I'll ask everyone to show of hands who uses stent retrievers and balloon guide catheter as their first line approach. So not that many hands. Who uses the ADAPT technique or aspiration catheters as their first line approach? Okay. And then some of these more uh, advanced techniques, which I'll talk about, captive, arts, and save. Um, which have recently been published. Um, we'll go over some of these. So the picture here demonstrates the typical setup of a balloon guide catheter that's placed in the cervical ICA, and then you advance a microcatheter and a wire beyond, in through the clot and beyond. You remove your wire and you deploy a standard stent retriever into the clot. And then with flow arrest, you remove that clot in the stent, hopefully with one pass. The data would show us that it usually takes, on average, about two passes to recanalize vessels with this technique. The ADAPT technique is getting more and more attention in the literature with the publication of the ASTER trial, and I'll go over some of the results of that. Um, it's a direct first pass aspiration technique using really large bore aspiration catheters and the technology of these catheters has allowed us to be able to advance large catheters into the intracranial circulation in both the M1 segment and the Basler. And then the Salumbra technique was really developed out of cases of failed direct aspiration, where if you brought a large bore catheter up and you were unsuccessful at aspirating the clot, you could then deploy a stent into the clot and aspirate through the large bore catheter that's in the intracranial segment and remove the clot. And we, as I said, have had success using all of these techniques. Um, we primarily use balloon guide catheter and stent retriever because that's what the data and the Canadian guidelines told us was the choice of our first line therapy. In fact, the current Canadian guidelines, the 2015 published guidelines, give class one uh, level A evidence for stent retrievers and balloon guide catheters and level C for aspiration. Obviously that's going to change with some of the new data. And then these new techniques have been published and they're roughly getting similar recanalization rates and clinical outcomes as the ESCAPE trial, SWIFT, and some of the new trials that were published mainly using stent retrievers. And this is the ARTS technique, captive and save. Now, they're all sort of modification of, of the Salumbra technique, where you advance a large bore intermediate catheter into the intracranial circulation. And then where they've modified the technique is because of embolization to new territory. So in Salumbra, when you aspirate through the intermediate catheter that's in your distal um, supraclinoid ICA or proximal M1 segment, there's no flow arrest in the neck. So you have forward flow, so as you're 
pulling this into the stent, there's always the possibility of distal migration. The arts technique gets around that by preventing forward flow by using a balloon guide catheter in the neck. So there's no, there's flow arrest. You aspirate like the slumber technique and you try to remove the clot. The save technique um, deploys the stent more distally so that the distal, the proximal one third of the stent is embedded in the clot. So the stent is further out than our typical standard, um, putting the stent in the middle portion of the, um, the mid segment of the stent in the clot. Um, and then this is actually um, removed under um, aspiration through the intermediate catheter. Um, and then as the, inter as the clot enters the intermediate catheter, you then, you've wedged it, you no longer have forward um, aspiration from that catheter, you then start aspirating from your guide catheter. Now, Ryan McTaggart, um, the group in Rhode Island, they published the captive technique, which is very similar, but you start aspiration with the intermediate catheter before you fully deploy the stent. So you're aspirating for about 60 to um, 90 seconds before fully deploying the stent. And that's, again, to prevent distal emboli. And then you're wedging the intermediate catheter up against the deployed stent, against the clot, and you're pulling the whole thing out through an intermediate, um, through a large bore uh, catheter that's in the neck, not a, a balloon guide catheter. And these are sort of similar to what we get. I showed you a picture of the same sort of wedged clot, and part of it is actually in the um, intermediate catheter. Now, the other thing is you get a lot of aspiration out of the intermediate catheter when you remove your microcatheter. And removing the microcatheter typically advances the intermediate catheter up against the edge of the clot. It's often difficult in certain anatomy to advance these catheters, and removing the microcatheter helps your intermediate catheter advance right up to the M1 segment. Um, we sort of know that there's been many device trials um, that have been published, and this is starting to explode when you look at journals, uh, like the Journal of Neurointerventional Surgery. It seems like the journal has been taken over by stroke intervention. Um, and so there's new trials coming, and I think things will change from the original five trials uh, that were uh, published that prove that endovascular therapy for stroke is effective. Now, when you look at the five trials and the current guidelines that we're using in Canada, it's primarily based on stent retriever technology. Um, the majority of the trials, the patients were treated with stent retrievers. They obtained excellent recanalization rates and excellent clinical outcomes. And part of the big difference with those trials with using balloon guide catheters and stent retrievers was compared to IMS3, we also realized that there was a workflow process that you had to move quickly. It's not just the devices. So there's an important element of getting to the patient, puncturing, getting access with whatever catheter system you're using and removing the clot as quickly as possible. So I always say you can have the fastest F1 driver, but if nobody can change the tires, you're gonna lose the race. So it is a team effort. It's not just the interventionalist, and it's not just the technology. Um, the Hermes data was uh, really, again, emphasized that stent retrievers were the main device used across the main trials that were pooled in the analysis. And because of that, our guidelines really say that mechanical thrombectomy with stent retriever plus a balloon guide catheter in association with IVTPA is now the standard of care in anterior cerebral circulation strokes and that's class one level A evidence. They had favorable outcomes from the Hermes data, patients that are still independent with modified Rankin of zero to two um, based on su successful reperfusion. <coughs> now I could get Waleed to present this. This is the meta-analysis and um, systematic uh, review of <coughs> using a balloon guide catheters, so the evidence, but this um, systematic review meta-analysis is based on non-randomized data of roughly 2,000 patients. And again, it shows um, an effect on reperfusion using a balloon guide catheter, increased, increased reperfusion rates of TICI-3 and TICI-2B um, with a balloon guide catheter versus no balloon guide catheter, better clinical outcomes, and a, an effect on mortality, which uh, was only shown in the ESCAPE trial. Now, since the five trials, there have been a lot more uh, publications and, and studies on aspiration and the ADAPT technique. 
Um, and a lot of these studies have come out of the group from South Carolina. Now, the, uh, taking the ADAPT technique um, was put to a randomized clinical trial where they compared direct aspiration to stent retriever and balloon guide catheter. And this is a study of the ASTER trial that was uh, recently published. It's from France, and it was eight comprehensive stroke centers in France. There's roughly 400 patients, 190 roughly in both groups. They're all anterior cerebral circulation strokes that presented within six hours of onset. Baseline characteristics of the two groups are very similar in terms of age, baseline NIH stroke scale score, and vessel occlusion. The majority of the cases were M1 and supraclinoid ICA occlusions. Now, in terms of the interventional protocol, first-line contact aspiration, or the ADAPT, was really using a standard guide catheter in the neck, not a balloon guide catheter, and then using um, a microcatheter advanced over a microwire through the clot, and then advancing a large bore aspiration um, catheter right up to the edge of the clot, and then turning on the aspiration pump. For first-line stent retriever therapy, they all had to have a balloon guide catheter. Um, so you're now comparing balloon guide catheter to no balloon guide catheter in a randomized clinical trial, and you're comparing stent to aspiration catheter. Um, the majority of the stents in the, in the stent retriever group were Trevo or solitaire devices. Um, patients were crossed over if they were a failure therapy in the ADAPT. They were then could either use a Salumbra technique or a stent retriever, uh, and vice versa. In the, um, in the stent group, they could use an aspiration catheter. So what they showed was that there was no statistical difference between the two techniques. They had both excellent um, TICI 2B and 3 recanalization in the two groups. Um, and they showed that there was no significant difference in clinical outcomes at their repeat NIH at 24 hours and their modified Rankin score at 90 days. Um, so their conclusions from the ASTER trial was first, it's the first randomized clinical trial focusing on the ADAPT aspiration technique uh, with a blinded assessment data. ASTER trial shows no statistical difference between ADAPT and stent retriever as the first line approach for mechanical thrombectomy in stroke patients. So, as I told you, there's lots of factors in addition to devices that affect outcomes. Um, we treat pediatric patients, which is our next talk, hopefully if we get to it, and we treat really elderly patients. During my training, it was incredibly rare that anybody over the age of 70 was on, ever on the angio table. I think as neurointerventionalists, stroke has pushed our catheter skills to the next level. Um, a lot of the patients I deal with in Hamilton have crazy arches, femoral access, and we don't normally put patients that are 85 on the table to coil aneurysms or fix fistulas. So it's a whole new set of skills. Um, and what I find is that it, um, there's several factors that are going to affect your outcome. One is age. Age is a big factor, um, as well as their admission imaging. If they have poor collaterals, already have a poor aspects, then they're obviously not candidates. But if they have reasonable collaterals and a good small core with a good aspect score, then they're candidates. Another factor is clot burden, clot length, and clot uh, morphology, whether it's a red clot or a white clot, a fibrous uh, rich clot, I think really determines how these devices interact with clots, and I think there's a talk on that for tomorrow. And then one of my biggest um, things that slows me down is arterial access, and then the experience of the team, so there's system factors. Um, procedural failures in endovascular therapy, I break them up into actual intra-procedural failure, and then there's post-procedural failure. So access failure. How many people in the room have ever tried a case where they just can't even get a catheter? I think everyone should put up their hand because um, unless you're a miracle worker. Failure in recanalization or reperfusion. So having a poor ticky score, not being able to get out the clot. Patrick's got his hand up. I have my hand up. Intraprocedural aspects decay. So if you put somebody on the table with poor collaterals and they're on the table for a long time, their aspects is going to decay, their infarct is going to uh, progress at a rapid rate. And then post-procedural failure, this might be related to TPA, no TPA, whether they hemorrhage, whether they have a big stroke and they need a hemicraniectomy. 
And patients that end up with a Rankin of greater than three, to me, that's a failure. Difficult access, it can be femoral. The arch is a big deal, um, typically in elderly patients. And then sometimes we deal with lots of tortuosity in the extracranial carotids. We dealt with the concept of dissection. Here's an interesting case where you do an aortic arch run and you see that a patient with right MCA occlusion or stroke has an occluded innominate. And when you do a selective subclavian injection, you see that they'll retrogradely fill the carotid from the vert. So how are you going to get there? It's a little bit of an access issue. Um, and so we have these patients where we struggle to navigate through their arch. Um, and so we've taken on the approach of direct carotid puncture. And this is an example of where we use ultrasound guidance, a microcatheter, um, a micropuncture kit, and we exchange for either a five or six French sheath. So you're no longer using a balloon guide catheter. You're now into an adapter, or a Salumbra technique, because there's no way you can put a large bore balloon guide catheter through this system, especially if the patient has TPA. If they don't have TPA, it's a little bit easier to deal with. Um, the next image here shows you our micropuncture kit, our wire navigation. We exchange that uh, and put in a sheath. This has been published by Adnan Siddiqui and a few other groups, the same technique of direct carotid puncture. Typically, patients are intubated because we want to take them back to ICU and they remain intubated and we measure their neck circumference for the first little while every 15 minutes. We try to make the smallest possible sheath size as possible. So these cases were typically using a five French cat or Sophia catheter. Um, so it's typically an intermediate catheter and an adapt technique. If the adapt technique doesn't work, we then use a stent retriever. Vascular closure device, I prefer the minx because it doesn't leave an anchor on the intraluminal aspect of the vessel as opposed to angio seal. Now there's evidence that angio seal is safe to use to seal the carotid, especially in a patient that has full dose TPA, um, where there's very few complications reported, although these are really small studies. Um, our typical approach for anterior circulation is balloon guide catheters with patients awake. If we need sedation, we tend to use dexmethotomidine because it doesn't lower the blood pressure. We use a standard long sheath, either eight or nine French, a balloon guide catheter, a stent retriever. If that fails, we then uh, use an intermediate catheter as rescue therapy. We will sometimes use IV t uh, I intraarterial TPA and we treat vasospasm with calcium channel blockers and milrinone. So here's the cases that you like because they're, they're late at night and you get to go home when you open this with a first pass with a balloon guide catheter and a stent retriever and the patient has a good outcome. She was last seen normal two hours ago. If I was called from Telestroke and she was from this area, I'd say she was last seen normal in 1967 when the Leafs won the cup. But uh, so these patients do well when things work well. But when things don't work well and you do multiple passes to open this with a stent retriever or uh, an ADAPT technique, you then have to use an adjunct therapy. And this is a case where we tried to do an ADAPT um, aspiration. It didn't work. We deployed a stent. We wedged the clot up against this intermediate catheter and ended up with a good result. Now, this is a gentleman that was in, as an inpatient with a uh, left ventricular thrombus on IV heparin. He has no flow, but he has good collaterals on his CTA. After a first pass with a solitaire and a balloon guide catheter, <coughs> looks good, but you still see this thrombus sitting in the M1 segment. We do three more passes to try to get it out, and things start looking worse. We then try uh, an intermediate catheter, an ARC catheter, and things look even worse after a few attempts with that. We decide to inject from the right side. We see that he, there's this stump in the A1 segment on the left, but the ACA distally fills from the right side, and then he has collaterals backfilling the left. So we stopped. Um, this is his follow-up scan five days later. He still has the occluded vessel. Unfortunately, he has a large infarct and some um, convexity subarachnoid hemorrhage. Posterior circulation uh, cases, we typically, as I said, they're intubated. We typically, if there's tortuosity of the carotid, use an ADAPT technique with a long sheath as it's too dangerous to advance a balloon guide catheter. So here's a pigtail origin of the vert. 
And what we do is usually put a six French shuttle in the subclavian and then we advance either a Sophia or a five French cat through that tortuosity over a microcatheter and then proceed with um, removing the clot using either an adapt technique or a stent retriever. Sometimes we have to chase distal emboli. Um, and I think one of the successes is actually looking at your times at your center and seeing how well you do. There's published guidelines on this, on what we should be doing with these cases, regardless of the, the technique or the device you're using. And the Canadian guidelines are pretty much in, in line with the SNIS guidelines. So door to puncture less than 60 minutes, pitcher to puncture less than 30, door to recanalization less than 90. I sort of look at our own metrics as successful cases where you have a good clinical outcome, you've usually from good recanalization, and we've avoided embolization to new territory, ease of use of the device, number of passes, and then the hospital is always on to us about the cost of what we're doing. We get these report cards in Hamilton that tell us exactly what parts of the steps where we're, we're doing well and where we're not doing well. And we do this for every single case, we review them. Um, so you can see here, puncture to recanalization was 19 minutes. This is what we like to see. Some of these red things are other parts that we're trying to work on. Provincial metrics will come and we'll have to keep up the standards. Um, this publication showed that when you um, have a standardized approach, you can really improve your times, whether you're using captive technique or uh, Salumbra or ADAPT or a stent retriever. Um, and I think you have to include all your nurses and techs in learning these techniques and how to be fast. We now have a standardized whole prep kit that has all of our connectors, everything in a sterile bag. We just open this and we're ready to go. So we save a lot of time not having to open small little connectors. And we also send off all our clots to pathology. We send every single clot we remove to pathology. This is an issue when we use the penumbra pump. Sometimes I don't find the clot. It's in the, looks like sort of a, a smoothie for a vampire um, when you're finished. But this clot ha happened to be from an atrial myxoma. So it was very valuable to send this to pathology because it told us what the patient had as a cardioembolic stroke. Um, so in conclusion, current evidence suggests that balloon guide catheter plus stent retrievers or ADAPT aspiration technique with large bore aspiration catheters are both acceptable first line approaches for large vessel occlusion ischemic strokes. I think you need to have a systematic standardized approach to endovascular therapy to decrease your procedural times regardless of the technique you're using. And I think that you do have to, in these cases, know when to stop. And um, you can injure patients when you don't stop and you keep trying new things to try to open vessels. Um, Thanks.